morning, everyone. It's good to see you here. This evening, we are going to continue the study that we started in our last session yesterday. Uh, we were discussing the period of the seven last plagues, particularly the sixth plague of the book of Revelation. And in order to give a little bit of context, I want to review just some basic elements that we studied in our lecture yesterday. You remember that in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14, we are told that a threefold union is going to gather all of the world on Satan's side to struggle against God and his people on the other side. I want to read those verses. They're found in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14. Here we find the following words. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. The unclean spirits, of course, are fallen angels. Coming out of the mouth of the dragon, which we've identified as the civil powers of the world, out of the mouth of the beast, which represents the papacy, and out of the mouth of the false prophet, which represents apostate Protestantism. And then we find what is the purpose of these three unclean spirits, these three fallen angels, so to speak. They're going to do something. In verse 14, we're told, For they are the spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So the purpose of these three fallen angels is to gather all of the world on Babylon's side, on the side of the devil. We know that in Revelation we also have three godly angels that are sent to gather God's people on His side. So the final controversy is going to be between those who are gathered on God's side and have the seal of God and those who are gathered on Satan's side and have the mark of the beast. Now when this time comes, we need to be sure that we're on the right side. And of course, the verse that we especially studied yesterday tells us how we can be sure to be on the right side. That verse is Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15. This verse is a parenthesis in the flow of the argument. It tells us what we need to do to make sure that when this time comes that we are on the right side. We find the following words there in Revelation 16, verse 15. Jesus is speaking in this verse. Behold, I am coming as a thief. We studied that yesterday. Is that referring to the second coming of Christ? No. It's referring to the time when probation closes for the world. In other words, when all cases have been decided shortly before the second coming of Christ. So it says, Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming as a thief, Blessed is he who watches. You remember we studied what it means to watch yesterday? It means to be awake, to be alert, to pay attention to what's happening. And then we find a third characteristic. It says, and keeps his garments. Now what does it mean to keep the garments? It means to guard your garments. Why? What would happen if you don't guard your garments? We find the answer in the rest of the verse. It says, lest he what? He walk naked and they see his shame. Now yesterday we studied about what it means to walk. In the Bible, when the word walk is used to describe God's people or those who follow the devil, what does walk mean? It refers to our behavior. It refers to our lifestyle or to our conduct. In other words, whenever the Bible says that we need to walk with the Lord, it means that we need to walk as He walked. In 1 John 2, verse 6, we find the words that whoever says that he is in Jesus needs to walk even as he walked. So basically, to walk, figuratively speaking, in the Bible means to conduct yourself the way Jesus conducts himself. Now, we also noticed that in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 13 and 14, we have this threefold union that is mentioned the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And we notice that this is not the first time in the book of Revelation where you have this trilogy. Actually, this comes from Revelation chapter 12 
and chapter 13. In chapter 12 you are introduced to the dragon. That represents the civil power that tried to slay Jesus as soon as Jesus was born. Then in Revelation 13 we have the beast, the beast that rules uh, for 42 months. And that represents the papacy who ruled in the past for 1260 years. And then we have the false prophet or the beast that rises from the earth that has two horns like a lamb. That represents apostate Protestantism as it is represented especially in the United States. In other words, the final controversy is going to be caused by this threefold union at the end of time. Now I want us to go in our Bibles to Revelation chapter 6 and we want to read verses 9 through 11. Revelation chapter 6 and verses 9 through 11. Now I need to give you a little bit of context that, about where this passage appears in the flow of Revelation chapter 5 and 6. In the book of Revelation we have seven seals. The first four seals are four horses. The, the first horse is a white horse. And the white horse represents the apostolic church, the church that goes out conquering and to conquer. And it's white because white represents purity. The early church, the apostolic church, was a pure church. The second seal is a red horse. In the Bible, red represents bloodshed. When the gospel was preached, the result was that the emperors of Rome persecuted those who were preaching the gospel. So the second horse represents the period when the empire rises against the apostles who are preaching the gospel. Then you have the third seal which is a black horse. And the black horse represents the period when apostasy entered the church in the days of the emperor Constantine. All sorts of human traditions and errors entered into the church. In the Bible, black represents darkness, it represents error, it represents heresies. And so the third church is the church that compromises in the days of Constantine. The fourth church represents the papacy that rises in the midst of this apostasy. And the papacy uh, is represented by this yellow horse. The yellow horse is the horse of death because it says in the text that this uh, horse is his name is death and Hades or the grave follows him. In other words this is a period when God's people are slain by this system because they don't agree with the errors and traditions that are being taught by the apostate church. And then we have this seal, the fifth seal. And I want to read these verses and then we're going to try and unpack them. It says in verse 9 of Revelation chapter 6, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. So you have a group of individuals that have been killed and they're crying out from under the altar. This is the altar of sacrifice in the court of the sanctuary. This is symbolic language by the way. All these souls are not under the altar. It represents the same thing as the story of Cain and Abel. You remember when, when God told Cain and Abel to bring a sacrifice? And uh, Abel brought an animal to sacrifice, but Cain brought the fruit of the ground? Well, what happened? Right there next to the altar where Abel offered the blood sacrifice, Cain rose and killed his brother and shed his blood there next to the altar. And so God says, uh, Cain, where is your brother? And uh, he says, am I my brother's keeper? And then God said, the blood of your brother Abel cries out from the earth to me. So basically when it says the soul is crying out, the word soul in the Bible is translated many times life. The life of Abel is crying out because an injustice has been done. And so these martyrs that were killed during the period of the fourth, of the fourth seal of the horse of death are crying out because they've been, they've been slain because they upheld the word of God and they had the testimony of Jesus. And now notice verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? In other words, how long do we have to wait until you judge and avenge our blood that has been shed? In other words, our blood is crying out for justice because what has been done to us is a terrible injustice. Our persecutors are wrong and we are right. So why are we dead and why are they alive? That's basically what they're crying out. 
And now notice what God says to these individuals. And this is figurative language. This is not literal language. In the book of Revelation, we're dealing with figures. Verse 11 says, Then a white robe was given to each of them. Uh, now this is close to the theme that we've been studying. Remember, we're studying about uh, having, keeping the garment and not walking naked. Well, here you have a group of martyrs that they receive what? They receive a white robe. Each of them does. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer. What does it mean that they should rest a little while longer? What does rest mean? God is saying to them, you're going to have to sleep the sleep of death a little while longer because now is not the time when I'm going to judge and avenge your blood. That's coming in the future. But you have your white garment. In other words, you're safe. You're secure. When you died, you were not naked. You had my righteousness covering you. And, and so they're told to rest a little while until something happens. Notice what the last part of verse 11 says. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until they're, they're going to sleep until a certain moment, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were, was completed. So do you notice in this passage that there is a past group of martyrs and there is also a what? There is also a future group of martyrs. And when the future group of martyrs is killed, then all of the martyrs will have died and then God will judge and avenge not only the past martyrs, but He will judge and avenge, avenge the martyrs that will be slain in the future. Are you following me or not? Now, what is represented by the garment that is given to them? We need to understand uh, something very important, and that is that the garment that we receive now is a spiritual garment. In other words, it's not a literal robe that we receive. It's not even literal light that covers us. What the robe represents is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, when we receive Jesus as our Savior, we are covered with Christ's righteousness. That is a spiritual robe. But whoever has the spiritual robe, someday they will receive what? They will receive a literal robe of light. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3. And uh, this I did not have in my notes, but I'm going to read it because it's very important. Revelation chapter 3 and verses 4 and 5. I want you to notice that there's a spiritual robe that those who believe in Christ receive now, and then there's a literal robe for those who receive the spiritual robe. It says in verse 4, You have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their what? So did they have garments at that time? Of course they did. They have not defiled their garments. And now notice, talking about the future, and they shall walk with me, how? That's future, in white, for they are worthy. Verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in what? In white garments. And I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So these martyrs had the spiritual robe. They were given the white robes of Christ's righteousness when they died. Their case was secure. But when they resurrect, they're going to receive what? They're going to receive their literal robe of light. Now I want to read you a few statements here uh, where we have uh, an explanation of what is represented by the garment. In the book Councils on Education, page 237, we find this very significant statement. When Christ shall come, He will not change the character of any individual. Precious probationary time is given to be improved in washing our robes of character. So what, what does a robe represent? It represents your character. So probationary time is given to be improved in washing our robes of character and making them white in the blood of the Lamb. In another statement that we find in volume 3 of the Testimonies, page 183, we find these words. The provision has been made for us to wash. The fountain has been prepared at infinite expense. 
and the burden of washing rests upon us. God provides the water and the soap, so to speak, but we must do the washing with the water and the soap. The statement continues saying uh, the following, and I begin once again at the beginning of this statement. The fountain has been prepared at infinite expense, and the burden of washing rests with us who are imperfect before God. The Lord does not propose to remove these spots of defilement without, without our doing anything on our part. We must wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. We may lay hold of the merits of the blood of Christ by faith, and through His grace and power we may have strength to overcome our errors, our sins, our imperfections of character, and come off victorious, having washed our robes in the blood of the Lamb. So what this is saying is that the martyrs who died had a character that was in harmony with the principles of Christ's kingdom. And therefore, they had the spiritual robe, and God says, you just rest a while, you're going to remain asleep in the tomb until the number of martyrs is complete, and when the number of martyrs is complete, I will judge and avenge, and I will reward both groups of martyrs. Now, the question is, when were the martyrs of the past slain? And when will the martyrs of the future be slain as well? We don't have to guess. The Bible tells us that the beast, which is mentioned in the passages that we read, the beast persecuted the saints of the Most High for 1,260 years through mechanisms such as the Inquisition. Millions of God's children were killed for their faith during the period of the dominion of the Papal Church. That is the group of the martyrs of the past, those who were killed under the fourth seal, the horse of Hades, the horse of death. I want to read a statement that we find in Great Controversy, pages 59 and 60, this magnificent book on uh, history as well as end time events. Uh, the writer says this, In the 13th century was established that most terrible of all the engines of the papacy, the Inquisition. Have you ever heard of the Inquisition? It was a terrible thing. Those who did not agree with the practices and with the beliefs of the church were tortured and they were slain during this period. The writer continues, The Prince of Darkness wrought with the leaders of the papal hierarchy. In their secret councils, Satan and his angels controlled the minds of evil men, while unseen in the midst stood an angel of God taking the fearful record of their iniquitous decrees and writing the history of deeds too horrible to appear to human eyes. Babylon the Great was drunken with the blood of the saints. And now notice the last part of the statement. The mangled forms of millions of martyrs cried to God for vengeance upon the apostate power. So were the martyrs that were martyred during this period crying out for justice? Yes, they were righteous and their persecutors were wicked, but the wicked lived and the righteous died. That's an injustice. So they're crying out, until when are you going to allow this reversal of justice to happen? They're given white robes and they're told, you got to rest until the future number of martyrs is complete. Now, the question is, when is it that the martyrs will cry out in the future? Because the martyrs are also going to cry out in the future. Once again, I want to read a very significant statement from Review and Herald, December 21, 1897. When the defiance of God's law is almost universal, boy, if that isn't true as we look at the world today, when the defiance of God's law is almost universal, when His people are pressed in affliction by their fellow men, God will interpose. Then will the voice be heard from the graves of the martyrs, represented by the souls that John saw slain for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ which they held. Then the prayer will ascend from every true child of God, It is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. 
the fervent prayers of His people will be answered, for God loves to have His people seek Him with all their heart and depend upon Him as their deliverer. He will be sought unto to do these things for His people, and He will arise as their protector and avenger. Shall not God avenge His own elect, which cry day and night unto Him? And so we have two groups of martyrs, the past martyrs and the future martyrs. And the reason why you have these two groups of martyrs is because the beast system of the book of Revelation has two stages of dominion. The Bible tells us that the beast persecuted for 1,260 years. But the Bible tells us that at the end of its period of dominion, this system received a deadly wound. In other words, it lost its power. But in Revelation 13, verse 3, it says that the deadly wound is going to be what? Is going to be healed, and the whole world will wonder after the beast. And those who do not wonder after the beast, what is going to happen with them? They will be persecuted. You say, how do you know that? Because in Revelation 13, verses 11 to 18, which we took a look at yesterday, we notice that another beast rises from the earth. And this beast has two horns like a lamb. But everything that this beast does, which rises after the first beast receives its deadly wound, is to please the first beast and give the first beast its power back. You say, how do we know that? Because in Revelation chapter 13, we are told several interesting things in verses 11 to 18. And I'm going to summarize. It says that this beast that rises from the earth will exercise all of the authority of the first beast. We are told that it will act on behalf of the first beast. It will command everyone to worship the first beast. It will make an image of the first beast. And it will impose the mark of the first beast. And Revelation 13, 11 to 18 tells us that whoever does not comply, they will not be able to buy or sell. And even worse than that, we are told that they will be condemned to die. And you say, that's impossible in the United States of America. That could never happen in this country. Well, never say never. Strange things do happen when we go astray from the Lord. In volume 5 of the Test Testimonies, page 712, uh, we find these words. When our nation shall so abjure the principles of its government as to enact a Sunday law, Protestantism will in this act join hands with popery. It will be nothing else than giving life. If it has to give life, it's because the system was dead. Then giving life uh, to the tyranny which has long been eagerly watching its opportunity to spring again into active despotism. And so you'll notice here that this beast power has two stages of existence. It persecuted the saints of the Most High during the 1260 years. And it will be helped by the beast from the earth to persecute those who will not worship the image of the beast or receive the mark of the first beast. Are you understanding what the future persecution and the future martyrs have to do? Now, I want to read a statement that we find in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4 so that you see very clearly that the last group of martyrs lived during the period of the beast, his image, and his mark. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. This is the, the righteous ones that are going to resurrect when Jesus comes. And they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been what? Beheaded. Remember the fifth seal? This is, this is remembering the fifth seal. Only this is dealing with the future martyrs. It's not dealing with the past martyrs because the past martyrs, the image did not yet exist and the mark of the beast was not yet imposed at that time. And so it says, Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. And now notice, Who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. Let me ask you, is there going to be a group of martyrs that will be beheaded because they did not worship the beast, his image, or his mark, and this is future? Yes. Is the same thing that happened in the past going to happen in the future? 
Yes, there will be two groups of martyrs because the beast has two periods of persecution. One period, 1260 years, ends in 1798 when the Pope is taken prisoner and taken to France, and the other period is in the future when the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet join forces to persecute those who do not agree with the apostate church. Unfortunately, there will be many individuals who claimed to be faithful to the Lord at that time that will apostatize and will forsake the ranks of God's people because they did not have the garment. I want to read from Great Controversy, page 608. As the storm approaches, the storm is this period of persecution, this terrible time of affliction. As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth. How are we sanctified? Through what? Through obedience to the truth, abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Now, if they have not been sanctified by obedience to the truth, do they have the garment? No, they don't have the garment. Uh, the, the writer continues saying, by uniting with the world and partaking of its spirit, they have come to view matters in nearly the same light. And when the test is brought, they are prepared to choose the easy, popular side. Men of talent and pleasing address, who once rejoiced in the truth, wow, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the bitterest enemies of their former brethren. When Sabbath keepers are brought before the courts to answer for their faith, these apostates are the most efficient agents of Satan to misrepresent and accuse them, and by false reports and insinuations to stir up the rulers against them. So persecution will be revived again. In uh, the book Counsels to the Church, page 39, we find these words, It is impossible to give any idea of the experience of the people of God who shall be alive upon the earth when celestial glory and a repetition of the persecutions of the past are blended. Now we have stories in the Bible that illustrate this period. I want, to, I want us to go in our minds to the story of Daniel and his three friends. Let's examine first of all the story of Daniel. Uh, the, uh, excuse me, the, the, the story of his three friends, and then we'll take a look at the story of Daniel. Now, what took place in Daniel chapter 3 on a local scale in literal Babylon with literal three young men in a literal valley is really symbolic of global events at the end of time. You see, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, who by the way, for a while lived as a beast, didn't he? He raises up an image, he commands everyone to worship the image, and whoever does not worship the image will be what? Will be killed. Does that kind of ring a bell? Have you ever thought of any other passage in the Bible that speaks about a beast uh, having an image and uh, giving a death decree against those who don't worship the image? We just noticed it. It's in Revelation chapter 13 and verses 11 to 18. The Bible tells us that during this period, even people will not be able to buy or sell. People will be doomed to death. It says, whoever does not worship the image of the beast, there will be a death decree against them. I want to read from Manuscript Releases, volume 14, page 91. An idol, this is connecting Daniel 3 with the end time. An idol has been set up as the golden image was set up in the plains of Dura. And as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, issued a decree that all who would not bow down and worship this image should be killed, so a proclamation will be made that all who will not reverence the Sunday institution will be punished with imprisonment and death. So there you have the parallel between what happened in the days of the three friends of Daniel and what is going to happen at the end of time. Now here's the question, how did Daniel's friends reveal that they had experienced righteousness by faith? How did they reveal that they had the garments of Christ's righteousness? 
The answer is by the faithfulness that they showed in the midst of the trial. They showed that they had the garment because they were loyal and faithful to the Lord. We find in uh, the magazine Youth's Instructor, July 12, 1904, the following three words, the following words. The three Hebrews were called upon to confess Christ in the face of the burning fiery furnace. It cost them something to do this, for their lives were at stake. These youth, imbued with the Holy Spirit, declared to the whole kingdom of Babylon their faith. So how was it shown that they were covered with the garment? That they were covered with Christ's righteousness? Because they proclaimed their what? Their faith by their loyalty and their faithfulness. So once again, these youth, imbued with the Holy Spirit, declared to the whole kingdom of Babylon their faith, that He whom they worshipped was the only true and living God. The demonstration of their faith on the plain of Dura was a most eloquent presentation of their principles. The what of their faith? The demonstration of their faith. Our works demonstrate our faith. Our works exhibit our faith. And if our works do not exhibit our faith, it's because there is no faith and we are not covered with the robe. Well, we all know the story. The Bible tells us that the three young men were delivered from the fiery furnace. In fact, that word delivered is very, very interesting. It is used only in three contexts in the book of Daniel. It's used in Daniel 3 that we're studying. It's used in Daniel 6, which we're going to take a look at next. And it is finally used in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, the word deliver, in all three of these contexts, and they are very closely connected. Now I want to read the story as it appears in Daniel chapter 3, verses 16 through 18, and then we are going to jump down to verses 28 and 29. The king commands everyone to worship the image which he has raised up, and if people don't worship, they're going to be killed. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refuse. Let's pick up the story in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter, because the king has given them a second chance. If that is the case, our God whom we serve, does that have to do with action, serving? Or is it just believing something in your brain? No, it has to do with being faithful, with being loyal to God. So uh, our God whom we serve is able to deliver, there's the key word again, deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and He will deliver us from your hand, O King. But they're not presumptuous. They're not saying, God, you know, we're faithful and loyal to you. You have to deliver us whether you like it or not. No. We find in verse 18, but if not, they say, but if God doesn't deliver us, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. We are loyal to God. We are not loyal to you. And even if we have to die, we will show our faithfulness and our loyalty by dying. Let me ask you, did they have the garment? Like the martyrs had the garment? You better believe they did. But how is it shown that you have the garment? You show it by your faithfulness and your loyalty to God, by your life, by your works, by your walk, so to speak. Now in verses 28 and 29, we find the climax of the story. The three young men have been delivered by a, by a fourth mysterious person in the furnace, which is none less than the Son of God. It says, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel, and now notice the key word, and what? Delivered. And delivered his servants. What characteristic did they have? Trusted in him. To have faith in someone means to what? To trust them and trusted in him. And they have frustrated the king's word uh, and yielded their bodies that they should not serve nor worship any god except their own God. 
Therefore I make a decree, says Nebuchadnezzar, that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can, now comes the key word again, who can deliver like this. Let me ask you, is God going to deliver the martyrs of the past? Yes or no? Of course. Is He going to deliver those who will be slain in the future by this beast system? Absolutely. They will be delivered when they come forth from the tomb. And they are clothed with literal white robes because they were covered with the robe of Christ's righteousness which was exhibited by the fact that they were willing to die rather than be disloyal or unfaithful to God. Now Hebrews 11 picks up on the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Hebrews chapter 11 verses 33 and 34 we find the story of these three young men. And in Hebrews chapter 11 we're told that they were faithful to God, that they, that they quenched the fires of the furnace because of their faithfulness. Now I want to read from Prophets and Kings page 513 about the steadfast faith of these three young men. As in the days of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so in the closing period of earth's history, the Lord will work mightily in behalf of those who, now here comes a very important expression, who stand steadfastly for the right. Who will God intervene to deliver? Those who stand steadfastly for the right. They're exhibiting by standing steadfastly that they have a connection with Jesus and they have the spiritual robe. The writer continues saying, He who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain in the midst of the time of trouble, trouble such as not been seen since there was a nation. His chosen ones will stand on moved. Notice the two expressions, stand steadfastly and stand unmoved. Satan with all the hosts of evil cannot destroy the weakest of God's saints. Angels that excel, excel in strength will protect them and, and in their behalf Jehovah will reveal Himself as a God of gods able to save to the uttermost those who have put their trust in Him. Notice the three expressions, stand steadfastly, stand unmoved, and put their trust in the Lord. You see, when people have the garment, it affects the way that they walk. That's why Revelation 16, 15 says, don't uh, make, uh, or, or rather, make sure that when that time comes, you have the garment so that you don't walk what? Naked, without the garment. But if you have the garment, how are you going to walk? You're going to walk like these three young men. So in other words, our faith is shown by our faithfulness. Now I want, to, I want to notice also the story of Daniel in chapter 6. This is the story of when Daniel was cast into the lion's den. You know, I remember from the time that I was a little child that these stories would be told in Sabbath school. And I used to love these stories about, you know, how Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and was, he was delivered by God from the mouths of the lions. Now, I want you to notice Daniel chapter 6 and verse 5. What is this controversy about? Notice Daniel chapter 6 and verse 5. The enemies of Daniel are going to prepare a plot. They can't find anything that Daniel has done wrong. Except that Daniel's God has a law that they don't agree with. And so they're going to try and find a flaw in Daniel's keeping of God's law. It says in Daniel 6 verse 5, Then these men, that is the enemies of Daniel, said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning what? concerning the law of his God. Let me ask you, is the end, end time controversy going to have to do with God's law, faithfulness to God's law, versus unfaithfulness to God's law? Absolutely. Revelation 12, 17 says, The dragon was enraged with the woman, went to make war with the remnant of the seed who keep the commandments of God. The third angel's message says, Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And so the law of God 
will once again become the point of controversy at the end of time. Now we're told in the story that Daniel served his God continually and he was delivered. Chapter 6 is the second place in the book of Daniel where you have the word deliver, the key word deliver. I want to read now from chapter 6 and verse 16 and then we'll read verse 20 and verse 27. We can't read the whole chapter because we don't have the time. But let's read verse 16. So the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, now notice, your God whom you serve continually, He will deliver you. What does the king say to Daniel? I can't deliver you because the law that I've given cannot be changed. The laws of Medes and Persians cannot be changed. So you're beyond my capacity to deliver you. So the God that you continually serve, does that have to do with your conduct, the way that you walk? Serving God? Yes. So it says, your God whom you serve continually, He will deliver you. Notice verse 20, and when he came to the den, this is the next morning, uh, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to what? Here's the key word again, deliver you from the lions? And then finally at the end of the story in verse 27, the king makes a decree or a proclamation. Here he says, speaking about God, He delivers, there's the key word, and rescues, and He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So because Daniel had the garment of Christ's righteousness, and he exhibited by his faithfulness and loyalty that he had it, he was delivered by the Lord. Now I want you to notice Daniel chapter 6 and verse 22. Here Daniel is speaking, My God sent His angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before Him and also, O King, I have what? Done no wrong before you. Did Daniel have an exemplary life where he did no wrong and he was innocent? Absolutely. By the way, in Hebrews 11 and verse 33, do you know what Hebrews 11 says? This is the chapter of what? The chapter of faith that speaks about faith. Really, a better translation of the word faith in Hebrews 11 would be faithfulness because faith is exhibited by your walk or your behavior, by your faithfulness and your loyalty. In Hebrews 11 and verse 33, we find that it says that Daniel closed the mouths of the lions by faith. You see folks, that righteousness by faith is more than just a declaration by God. It's more than just a judicial act. It represents the unfolding of Christ's righteousness in the daily life of the followers of Jesus. It means total trust, confidence, and faith in the Lord no matter what might come. Is that the kind of faith that God's people are going to need at the end of time? Absolutely. That's what Revelation 16, 15 means when it says, Blessed are those who guard their garments so that they don't walk naked, so that their behavior is not a behavior devoid of the righteousness of Christ. Now I want to discuss for a few minutes the relationship between the writings of the Apostle Paul and the book of of James. At this point somebody might ask, does Paul's definition of righteousness by faith conflict with the definition that is given by James? Because you know Paul says that man is justified by faith without the works of law, and James turns around and he says, wasn't our father Abraham justified by works? Wasn't Rahab justified by works? So there appears to be a contradiction between Paul and James. Paul seems to say that righteousness by faith is simply that God declares you righteous and that's it. James seems to say that behavior counts whether you are righteous or not. Now, how do we reconcile these two points of view? Well, folks, 
faith and works are a package deal. Neither one can exist without the other. In order to be genuine, faith must be active. Faith is an action word. In other words, it's not something you believe in your head. It's something that is translated into action. You see, Paul is speaking of faith as the motivating force of works. James, on the other hand, is looking as the, at the result of true faith. In other words, Paul is talking about the motivating force of works, which is faith, and James is speaking about the works that have been motivated by faith. Paul was looking at the root, and James was looking at the fruit. True faith is an uncompromising trust in Jesus that translates into obedient faithfulness and loyalty to Jesus. In other words, faith is always faithful. And if faith is not faithful, it is not really faith. James presented two examples of faith in his book. First of all, Abraham, and then he presents Rahab. Now, the Bible tells us that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. But did Abraham act out his faith that he had? Of course he did. What did he do when God said to Abraham, I want you to leave Ur of the Chaldees and I want you to go to a place that I'm not going to tell you where it's at. At that point Abraham had faith. What did Abraham do? He said, Lord, that's wonderful. I have good faith. And that's it. No, what did he do? He packed up and he what? He packed up and he began the trip. In other words, his faith in God, which gave righteousness, he proved to have by his obedience to God. Obedience does not save you. Obedience is the fruit of your salvation, not the root of your salvation. And then he presents the case of Rahab. You know, Rahab the harlot lived in Jericho. And when the spies came to Jericho before its destruction, uh, the Bible tells us that she received them and she hid them in her house. And Hebrews 11 says that by faith she hid them in her house. You say, how much faith does it take to hide someone in your house? Well, it takes a lot of faith when if you're discovered, you're going to be killed. Notice Patriarchs and Prophets, page 482 and 483. The inhabitants of the city, that is of Jericho, terrified and suspicious, were constantly on the alert, and the messengers were in great danger. They were, however, preserved by Rahab, a woman of Jericho, at the peril of her own life. So was her act of faith an act of faithfulness? You better believe it. Her life was at stake. And then we find the conclusion to the statement, in return for her kindness, they gave her a promise of protection when the city should be taken. Was she protected as a result of her faithfulness? She most certainly was. You see, all of the heroes and heroines of the Hebrews chapter 11 are not merely believing something, they are actually doing something. They do it because they believe what God is saying. They trust God. You see, they didn't believe something, they believed in someone, that someone was trustworthy. They, they were acting upon God's Word. Their faith was made complete by their works, if you please. The emphasis on Hebrews 11 is not merely upon Christ's imputed righteousness, that Jesus declares us righteous when we repent and when we confess our sin. That is not the emphasis of Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is talking about the life that comes as a result of having the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It is a reflection upon the faithful, obedient life that flows from a commitment, a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. True faith always leads to faithfulness. Faithless works will not save a person, and a workless faith will not save a person either. Faith is the invisible side of works, and works are the visible manifestation of faith. Faith is the internal propelling force, and works are the external manifestation of that propelling force. All of the individuals mentioned in Hebrews 11, it's the chapter of faith, folks. It's the same word that is used in the third angel's message, the faith 
of Jesus, the faith that Jesus had. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that Abel offered a sacrifice. Enoch pleased God. Noah built an ark. Abraham left Ur not, go, not knowing where he was going. Abraham offered up his son. Isaac and Jacob blessed their offspring. Moses was hidden by his sister. Moses refused to be called Pharaoh's son. Moses left Egypt. Moses kept the Passover. Israel passed the Red Sea. Israel marched around Jericho. Rahab hid the spies. In other words, all of the heroes in, da in, Re uh, in Hebrews chapter 11 are doing something. They're showing that they have a saving relationship with Christ. In other words, their faith is revealed by faithfulness. And this is the emphasis, folks, in Revelation chapter 16, verse 15. It says there that you need to guard your garments because it affects the way you walk. If you don't have the garments of Christ's righteousness, you will walk naked. If you have the garments of Christ's righteousness, you will walk clothed. The walk is the manifestation of having the robe. Are you following me or not? Will the end time generation have that? Absolutely. Let me read you Hebrews 11 verses 34 to 40 where we find all of these action words describing the people of faith in the Old Testament. Here the Apostle Paul uh, writes, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith, notice, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the enemies of the, alien, the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead race to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. Notice all the description of the martyrs. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. Now there's one text in Daniel that I have not uh, mentioned yet. I just mentioned it in passing, where the word deliver is used. It's speaking about the future in this verse. You see, in Daniel chapter 3, the deliverance of the three Hebrew worthies from the fiery furnace, they were delivered in the past. In Daniel chapter 6, the word deliver is used to describe Daniel being delivered from death at the of, by the mouths of the lions. But this reference that I'm going to read is speaking about the end time. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. In the previous verses, to Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1, it speaks about the king of the north, which represents the evil powers at the end time who are going to persecute God's people. It says, the king of the north will go out to destroy and slay many. And when the king of the north goes out to slay God's people, we find the testimony of verse 1. At that time, Michael shall stand up. Michael is another name for Jesus. Michael means who is like God. That's the Hebrew meaning of the word. And of course it represents Jesus because Jesus is God. So Michael shall stand up, and he's going to stand up to defend his people. Notice, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble. Did uh, Daniel's three friends go through a time of trouble? Do you think it was easy to look at the furnace and know that you were going to be thrown in there? Did Daniel go through a severe time of trouble? Oh, absolutely he did. You know, I'm sure that he, that he could hear the lions roaring. And by the way, the lions were hungry because when the princes that planned to throw Daniel in there were thrown in afterwards, the, they, before they even reached the ground, the lions were having the banquet of the century. 
Now notice once again Daniel 12 verse 1, at that time when the powers of the earth go to destroy God's people, Michael shall stand up, that's Jesus, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never once since there was a nation, even to that time. But what's going to happen with God's people when Michael stands up? And at that time your people shall be what? Shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. The same word deliver referring to the deliverance of God's people at the end of time. You see after the close of probation God's people will go through the same experience that Daniel and his three friends went through but on a global scale. The faith of God's people will be exhibited by their faithfulness and loyalty to God. Faith without faithfulness is not really faith. Now I'd like to say something about some Seventh-day Adventist scholars. Some Seventh-day Adventist scholars are what I call soteriological dualists. In other words, when it comes to salvation, they're dualists. Whereas they are anthropological monists. Now I'm going to explain what these theological terms mean. As Seventh-day Adventists we believe that the body without the spirit is dead and the spirit without the body is simply breath. In other words, the only way in which body and spirit can function is if they are what? Together. If they are together. If the spirit enters the body, then the spirit energizes the body and you have a living being, you have a living person. And all Seventh-day Adventist scholars that I know, they say, oh, just like James says, the body without the spirit is dead. So this idea that man has a soul that leaves the body and flies off to heaven and the body is down here and that the soul can leave separate, live separately from the body, uh, Adventist theologians say that doesn't work because you have to keep the body and the spirit together. But when it comes to salvation, these same scholars say you're saved by faith alone and works have nothing to do with it. That's not what James says. James says as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. So how can we say that speaking in terms of anthropology, the nature of man, we say, well, you have to have the body and the spirit together, but when it comes to salvation you say, you can have bare faith without works. It doesn't make any sense because James says that as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. In other words, faith, in order to be true faith, has to be active. So you ask the question, is a man justified by faith or is he justified by works? How do we reconcile Paul and James? The only way folks is that James is teaching that faith is shown by faithfulness and obedience even to the point of being willing to die in order to be faithful to God. Justification is exhibited in a sanctified life. Faith is revealed in Abraham being willing to slay his own son and Rahab being willing to risk her life by receiving the spies. You know it's worthwhile for all Seventh-day Adventists and other people as well to read the chapter in the great controversy that is titled The Time of Trouble. This chapter explains in luxury of detail the preparation that God's people are going to need to go through this time of trouble that Daniel went through in the lion's den and that the three young men went through in the fiery furnace. God's people are going to go through a similar, similar time of trouble on a global scale. They will need the absolute assurance that their sins have been forgiven. And this assurance will lead them to be faithful to God because they know that they've been accepted by God, they know that Jesus has, has placed the garment of His righteousness upon them, so they say He has done that and we will be faithful to Him. In Great Controversy page 618 we find these words, As Satan accuses the people of God on account of their sins, the Lord permits him, that is permits the devil, to try them to the uttermost. Their confidence in God their faith, notice, notice, their confidence in God, their faith and firmness will be severely tested. Are you seeing how faith manifests itself? Notice the three key words. Their confidence in God, 
their faith and their firmness will be severely tested. As they review the past, their hopes sink. For in their whole lives they can see little good. They are fully conscious of their weakness and unworthiness. Satan endeavors to terrify them with the thought that their cases are hopeless, that the stain of their defilement will never be washed away. He hopes so to destroy their faith that they will yield to his temptations and turn from their allegiance to God. The devil is going to say, no, nah, no, nah, your sins are too great uh, for God to forgive them. Just give up. It's no use being faithful to God. Just give in so you can buy and sell and so that you can save your life. But they will not give in. Notice Great Controversy, page 622. Those who exercise but little faith now are in the greatest danger of falling under the power of satanic delusions and the decree to compel the conscience. And even if they endure the test, they will be plunged into deeper distress and anguish in the time of trouble because they have never made it a habit to trust in God. The lessons of faith, notice, the lessons of faith they have neglected, they will be forced to learn under a terrible pressure of discouragement. Now, let's talk just for a few moments about the armor. You see, some biblical texts speak about the garment of Christ's righteousness. Others refer to it as the armor. I want us to notice in Romans chapter 13, 11 to 14, that we have the, the uh, illustration of the armor that God's people are to wear. And uh, I want to read the commentary that we find in Review and Herald, July 1, 1915, about this armor. Uh, this is how it reads. Clad in the armor of Christ's righteousness, the church is to enter upon her final conflict. Fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners, she is to go forth into all the world, conquering and to conquer. The darkest hour of the church's struggle with the powers of evil is that which immediately precedes the day of her final deliverance. But none who trust in God, listen carefully, but none who trust in God need fear. For when the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall, God will be to His church a refuge from the storm. In that day the righteous only are promised deliverance. The righteous are promised deliverance. In volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 136, we find these words. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when His law is most despised, then should our zeal be the warmest and our courage and firmness the most unflinching. To stand in defense of the truth and righteousness, when the majority forsake us, to fight the battles of the Lord when champions are few, this will be our test. At this time we must gather warmth from the coldness of others, courage from their cowardice, and loyalty from their treason. So are you understanding a little bit more this verse, Revelation chapter 16 and verse 15? What will characterize those who lived during this period of the plagues, particularly the sixth plague. We are told there that these people will know that the close of probation is coming like a what? Like a thief. Therefore they will what? They will watch. They will be awake. They will not be surprised by the close of probation. And they will guard their what? They will guard their garments. And what does it mean to guard their garments? When they guard their garments, they walk clothed. They do not walk naked. So, is righteousness by faith only imputed to us and credited to our account? Or is righteousness by faith exhibited in a sanctified, loyal, and faithful life? It is exhibited in a faithful life. This is what is meant in the third angel's message. Chapter 14 and verse 12. It says, Here is the perseverance of the saints. Will the saints need perseverance during this period? Oh, you better believe it. Here is the perseverance of the saints. 
Here are they who what? Who keep the commandments of God and have what? The faith that Jesus had. The unshakable and unbreakable faith that Jesus had in the midst of trials. I'd like to end by reading just one statement that we find in volume 5 of the Testimonies, page 463. The work which the church has failed to do in a time of peace and prosperity is now a relatively time of peace and pro prosperity? Is it relatively peaceful and prosperous today? Yeah. Are we free to preach the gospel today? Preach the third angel's message? Absolutely. But we are told here that the work which the church has failed to do in, in a time of peace and prosperity, she will have to do in a terrible crisis under most discouraging, forbidding circumstances. The warnings that worldly conformity has silenced or withheld. What is that? The warnings that what? That worldly conformity has silenced or withheld must be given under the fiercest opposition from the enemies of the faith. And at that time the superficial conservative class whose influence has steadily retarded the progress of the work will renounce the faith and take their stand with its avowed enemies toward whom their sympathies have long been tending. These apostates will then manifest the bitterest enmity doing all in their power to oppress and malign their former brethren and to excite indignation against them. This day is just before us. The members of the church will individually be tested and proved. They will be placed in circumstances well, where they will be forced to bear witness for the truth. Many will be called to speak before councils and in courts of justice, perhaps separately and alone. The experience which would have helped them in this emergency they have neglected to obtain, and their souls are burdened with remorse for wasted opportunities and neglected privileges. Folks, I pray to God that that is not our experience, that we will be courageous in proclaiming these messages to the world and to the church without fear, because believe me, if this awakens opposition when we proclaim it and we get discouraged and we become politically correct, what makes us think that we're going to stand for the right when the real trials come and our very life is at stake? It is in times like these that we need to learn to trust God. Jesus said, He who is faithful in little will be faithful in much, and he who is unfaithful in little will be unfaithful in much. And Jeremiah expressed it this way, If you ran with men and you got tired, how do you think you're going to run with the horses? You know, some Christians say, you know, I, for example, I just don't have enough money to return the tithe. You know, the Bible says that we're supposed to return the tithe. It belongs to the Lord. And I know some Adventists, they say, well, you know, I just don't have enough money to return the tithe. But these same individuals will say, but when I have to give it all up for Jesus, it'll be no problem. I will give it all up. What makes you think that if you're not, if you're not willing to, to return 10% to the Lord, you're going to, the, at the end of time, when the trial is greater, you're going to be willing to give it all up, even your life. It's not going to happen. It's now that we learn to trust Jesus. It's now that we become covered with His robe of righteousness and we learn to live a sanctified life which is part of righteousness by faith. It is the fruit of of the act of justification that God provides for us in Jesus Christ. May that be our experience is my prayer. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for uh, the magnificent way in which you have revealed these things in your holy word. We realize that uh, faith is not a static word. Faith is not simply Christ crediting His righteousness to our account, although that is the foundation of everything, faith is manifested in our daily walk, in our conduct, in our behavior, in being like Jesus. It's a package deal. True faith works so that people can see Jesus in us. I ask, Lord, that this will be a reality that you will help us to grow from faith to faith until we have that faith that will be unshakable and unbreakable ready to stand in the crisis ahead. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.